One of the things I've had happen over and over again in my business is one of my clients or one of my customers telling me, you know what, I can do that myself. Or I've got a nephew who can do that for me. And you know what I do when I get that, that response? Go for it. Enjoy. Try it out. Every single time I've invited somebody to do it themselves, they come back. Now it's easy to lose sight of this, being at a word camp, or going to a meetup, or hanging out with technologists. But what you do is valuable. Don't forget that. The outside world, the people who are not here at WordCamp, think we're magicians. And it's important because it is valuable. The one other note I had here, and I think this is relevant, raise your hand if you're under 30. Now I'm going to give you the old guy comment. Listen to your parents. Because <laughs> I didn't. Right? It took me a long time to realize that my dad was right about everything. <laughs> so listen to your parents. Before I got into technology, I was in the film industry. That's what my degree is in. My degree is in cinema. It's all I wanted to be when I was a kid. I wanted to make movies until I got to the film industry. And I hated every single minute of it. And I lasted about two years. And when I got out, the one thing I knew I was good at was computing. And so I wanted to get a job where I could learn the computer in and out. And I decided I'm going to go into graphic design. Now I had no experience as a graphic designer. And I went and I responded to a job ad looking for a production designer. And I went, this was my last job interview, 23 years ago was my last job interview with Jeff Turner. So if you were here at WordCamp last year and we're at the business track, you're familiar with Jeff Turner. If you were at the business track at WordCamp OC, you're familiar with Jeff Turner. He's my old business partner. But this is my first interaction with Jeff Turner. I went in. And before you could even interview, they gave you a test. And the test was, assemble this car ad in 45 minutes using Quark. Anybody remember Quark? So I was there for the interview with a trained, traditional graph designer. And she had her portfolio. Do you remember the big leather? black portfolio. She had all her pieces. I had nothing. I was just sitting there in a t-shirt. And Jeff sat us both down in front of a computer and gave us a sketch of a car ad and said, lay this out in 45 minutes. I didn't have any design experience, so I just went for it. And I was actually pretty fast at the computer. So I just laid it out. And it looked like hell. And I remember in this interview hearing this other designer, because we were in the same room, huffing and puffing and stressing. I mean, you could f the, 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 the air was so thick in the room because she was so stressed. I finished in a half an hour. In 45 minutes, she had one box laid out. What I learned during the interview is no one had ever finished the test. <laughs> I was the first person to finish the test. <laughs> the lucky part was, is Jeff wasn't looking for design. He was looking for speed. And that's what I was focused on. Complete the car ad. I did it. Hired me on the spot. Six of us produced 40 ads a week. It was a skeleton crew, grueling hours. And we started at 5 p.m. We worked the graveyard shift. 
Sometimes my nights went till 5 a.m. the next morning. That was my shift. Monday through Thursday. And I loved it. It was great. I was part of a fantastic team. The way we sent our ads in to get approved is we printed them on legal, CMYK, three up on a page. So every full page ad was 12 sheets, right? Three up, four colors. And then you had to paste them once they printed. Well, this is 1992. So sending an ad to print took about an hour and a half. Here's what I did with my downtime. Sitting on the shelf, we had a copy of Macker Mind Director 3.1. And I pulled it off the shelf, and I took all that downtime, and I taught myself how to code. Three years into the job, I came to Jeff. I wrote a business plan. I said, you know what? We do all these great services for, for these clients. I think they could benefit from CD-ROMs. Let's make CD-ROMs. And I took him to lunch, and I presented the business plan, and he loved it. And he took it back to his business partners, and they all hated it. And he called me that night and said, Zengi, I really want to do this, but nobody's going to sign off on it. And I said, Jeff, I love you. I respect you. I quit. And two weeks later, I started Zeke Interactive. <clears throat> Don't be afraid to take risks. If you are, you're in the wrong business. Now, I say that, but really what I took was a calculated risk. So I'm all about risk, but really I'm all about Calculated risk. Once I started Zeke, I started with no clients, no prospects, no business plan, no money, nothing. Completely bootstrapped. I didn't make a dime for two years. But I stuck at it. And here's what happened. What I did during that time, during that two years, is I would talk to anyone that would listen to me about what I was doing. It didn't even have a name yet. It hadn't been invented yet. I was making it up as I went along. But the thing I got involved in really early on was a thing called special interest groups. That was the predecessor to meetups, SIGs. Anybody remember a SIG? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. So there used to be a, 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 um, an organization called the LAMG. It was the Los Angeles Macintosh Group. They were in Santa Monica. And I started attending the Macromedia Director SIG because that's what I was good at. And very quickly, the organizer of the SIG, Richard Jenkins, Rec realized that I was the technical expert in the room. And so he would start calling on me for the technical parts of the, uh, parts of the, of the meetings. And I started leading a dev meetup, or a dev SIG. And then I took over the general SIG. And I became the guy. I became the Macromedia guy in town. Well, the LAMG used to hold a conference called MacFair in Burbank. And because I was giving back to them, they decided to give back to me. And that one year in 1997 at Mac Fair, they had an open booth that nobody had bought. And they said, would you like this booth? I said, absolutely. I had no idea what I was going to do with this space. <laughs> but again, I would talk to anybody that would listen about what I did. So my business partner at the time and I set up what we called the Shockwave Lounge. That was our booth. We got two of the nastiest couches you'd ever seen that we found on the side of the road. We put them in this booth. 
we got a very nice coffee maker and a, a coffee table, and on the coffee table was a Mac. And as people walked by, we welcomed them in to just take a load off so that we could show you our portfolio. Again, I had no idea where this was going to lead. And everybody that came in the entire weekend said, wow, this is fantastic. I have no idea how to hire you. I don't know what to do with you. You don't have a place, but it's cool. Until 4.30 on Sunday afternoon, a person sat down by the name of Linda Keeler. And we showed her our stuff. And she said, I've been looking for this. She said, I'm working on a website right now for a Michael Keaton movie. And I need games. And you guys are the only pe people I know that know how to do this. Come to my office first thing Monday morning and we'll discuss the contract. And we got our first paying gig off of that for the movie Multiplicity. Anybody remember that movie? <laughs> So we built five games for multiplicity, and that put us on the map. And here's what happened. We got hired to build five, and we built four. And we forgot about the fifth. Until the last minute, when the account manager called us and said, where's the fifth game? And we had worked hard on all, five, on all four games. I mean, they were great games. And she said, OK, what's the fifth? And we were a week away from deadline. And over the phone, I said, oh, we've got it. Not to worry. Punch the clown. And she said, what? So these games were stress test games. That's what these were. So the idea behind the website was you take these, these, these stress tests, you realize that you're stressed, and you need a clone. That was the gimmick. It's multiplicity, right? So we built all these stress test games, and Punch the Clown was this stupid idea that came out of my head. Do you remember the old blow-up toy clowns that you punched, and then they rocked back and rocked, you, and then you punch them again, and they, that, that was the whole game. <laughs> it was this clown that was bouncing around the screen, and you touched it, and it rocked back, and then rocked forward, and started all over again. That was the whole activity. I programmed, I des we designed and programmed this game in one day. And that was the game. <laughs> that was the game that took off. That was the game that Macromedia featured as their site of the day. <laughs> that was the game that won us awards. This stupid little game. And we became the Punch the Clown guys. <laughs> so we'd go into meetings, and people would say, it's the Punch the Clown guys. So you never know. The one thing I wanted to, the point I wanted to make here is, a lot of people say to me, oh, you're lucky. You've been doing this for 20 years. That's lucky. I don't believe in luck. I believe that you create your own luck. So had we not been sitting there in, and had that booth at the, uh, at the Mac Fair, we would not have had the opportunity to meet Linda Keeler and get our first job. That's not lucky. That's just creating opportunities. <clears throat> so how did I get into WordPress? Ten years ago, a friend of mine was working at an ad agency up in the Bay Area. And he called me and he said, I've got this guy in LA that's going to do some we're going to do some advertising for, and he needs some web work. Go, take, go have lunch with him. And I said, sure, not a problem. And so I set, up, um, I set up lunch, and we went to Typhoon at Santa Monica Airport. Ever, anybody ever been there? Sure. Absolutely. Great, great Thai restaurant on the second level of, of Santa Monica Airport. And the guy I was meeting with is a gentleman by the name of Andrew Breitbart. So if you don't know who he is, passed away recently, he created the Drudge Report. I didn't know it at the time, but I was sitting across the table from about the most powerful man in politics. He controlled the cable news. To me, just a dude. 
So we're sitting, we're talking. He grew up in Brentwood, I grew up in Woodland Hills. We're talking about, you know, our past. We're, you know, we've got some similar upbringing. And we order a couple of beers, and we're shooting the shit. And the, uh, the waiter comes around and says, should I bring some appetizers? And we said, yeah, sure. You want spring rolls? You want this? You want that? You want scorpion? Yeah, whatever. <laughs> I figured that's just the name of a dish. <laughs> Before I know it, while we're talking, this server sets down in the middle of the table two scorpions. Actual scorpions. Cooked scorpions. And we both pause. We stop short in the middle of the conversation. And we're staring at two scorpions. And so I did what you should do in that situation. I said, on three. <laughs> <laughs> and he loved it. And we both picked up our beer. And we picked up our scorpion. And I counted to three. And we ate the scorpion and then chug the beer. It was the nastiest thing I've ever put in my mouth. <laughs> and right after he was done swallowing the scorpion, he said, you're hired. <laughs> and Andrew then proceeded to introduce me to every single one of his friends. And an endorsement from Andrew was gold. I never wrote a proposal. I never submitted a bid. I was just hired. I'd go into these meetings, and they'd said, you're a friend of Andrew's, you're hired. Moral of the story, eat more scorpion. <laughs> <laughs> My daughter, who's sitting in the audience, was a Girl Scout at one point. Raise your hand. <laughs> and one night, I'm sitting in the office, and it was Girl Scout cookie time. And if, you, if you've ever been the parent of a Girl Scout, you know that you end up with about 20 boxes of Girl Scout cookies, right? You end up buying all the surplus. So I bought them, and I brought them to the office. And I'm working late on a deadline. Everybody else is gone. And I go into the kitchen looking for a cookie. I like the Samoas. They actually, they're, they're caramel delights. Excuse me, that's more politically correct now. <laughs> And the only thing left in the kitchen is Thin Mints. I hate Thin Mints. <laughs> and I went back to my office, and this was seven or eight years ago, and I posted onto Facebook, of all the Girl Scout cookie flavors, Thin Mints suck the most. Oh, yeah. Oh, I know. <laughs> Oh, trust me. And I went back to work. <laughs> and then I started seeing the alerts. <laughs> and it started a thread. And this is early Facebook days. And you would have thought I started World War III. <laughs> and once the conversation died down a little bit, because now I ignored work, and I'm watching, I'm learning how social media works. Conversation died down, and somebody said, Oh, let me tell you about when you freeze a Thin Mint, right? You freeze a Thin Mint and then you blah, 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 blah. And I said, look, if you've got to freeze that cookie to make it edible, there's something wrong with the cookie in the first place. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> Again, you would have thought I had insulted this guy's mother. But here's the deal. It's OK to have an opinion. It's OK to take a side. Take a side. It doesn't mean you're bad or good or wrong or right. It just means you have an opinion. Have you ever watched the water cooler? That's all we do on Monday mornings is we debate. It doesn't mean we don't like each other. We're just debating. Does anybody know who James Dalman is? So James Dalman is a fantastic artist in our community out of, out of Oklahoma. And I had the pleasure of meeting him two years ago in San Diego. He and I have nothing in common. He's a military guy. He lives in Oklahoma. Except I learned at dinner that he's on the wrong side of the Van Halen debate. 
He's a Sammy Hagar fan. That's not something you want to mess with with me. So we spent most of the evening talking about why David Lee Roth is the only lead singer of Van Halen. And that's become our thing. I just saw James in Vegas last weekend. And right away, we started talking about Van Halen. That's our connection. And that's OK. Sean Hesketh is the founder of WordPress 101. He lives in Houston. For those of you who know me, know that I'm a Clippers basketball fan. Well, Sean is a Rockets fan. So this past postseason, when the Clippers were playing the Rockets, Sean had a lot of fun with Photoshop at my expense. <laughs> and I didn't really know him that well before that. But I saw him recently at Chris Lemma's house about a month ago, and we're best buds. And again, it's OK to take a side, have an opinion. It's what leads to good conversation, good debate, and good relationships with people you might not normally have a chance to have a relationship with. So I've been doing this for 20 years, and I'm looking forward to the next 20. But let's talk about some of the ways, and some, or excuse me, some of the tips I have for how to survive in tech. And if you ask me for my slides, they're so simple I never post them. So take good notes. <laughs> they're really easy. Number one, remember your roots. We all came from somewhere. We all came from humble beginnings. We all started somewhere. And someone here at this WordCamp is where you were a year ago, five years ago, 20 years ago. That's a good thing. Embrace that. Help those people out. It's important for the survival of our community. Be altruistic. Whatever your motivation is, make sure it's for, for the good of the community, for giving back. If your motivation is anything else, it's not going to feel authentic. So I lead the OC WordPress meetup, and I've been doing it for six years. And I founded it on the premise of developing a community and giving back, and actually helping, find pe helping people find jobs and projects. So this is an important one. Fail. If you're not failing, you're not trying. To use a sports analogy, you miss 100% of the shots you don't take. And here's what's important. You need to learn how to fail to succeed. And I know this sounds cliche, and I know you hear this over and over again. My other daughter, who's in the audience, raise your hand. <laughs> this is her first year playing soccer, and they won their game this morning. And I've coached, I've been an AYSO coach eight times. This is my eighth time coaching in AYSO. The AYSO's philosophy, everybody from, anybody familiar with the AYSO? No. Does everyone ever get the ribbon? Yes. Everybody wins. Yes. Participation ribbons. Everybody gets a trophy. Everybody wins. I don't believe in that. I still coach AYSO, and I will put on the right face when I'm coaching. But I tell my girls and my kids, you know what's really fun? Winning. <laughs> That's really fun. Be open to change. I've pivoted several times in 20 years. I started out as a CD-ROM company, and that died the day I started Zeke. It's actually to the day. No, that's not true. So we pivoted, and we became a shockwave company, online games. Did that for five years. Noticed that as we were building games, our clients were asking more and more for full websites. So we turned ourselves into a full web developer in 2001, and then took on WordPress when I met Andrew Breitbart uh, about 10 years ago. About seven years ago, I took on mobile. So these days, I do mobile, and I do WordPress. 
So I've done a lot of different things. Ten years from now, and I know we're at a WordCamp, we may not be talking about WordPress. Things change. Be open to it. I'm hoping that we're talking about WordPress from 10 years from now. I'm not saying, I'm not saying we won't be, but things do change. I love the after after party. That's my favorite thing to do when I'm at a conference. Whatever your vice is, I will go experience it with you. <laughs> you want to go drinking? Not a problem. You want to go smoke cigars? Perfect. You want to play poker? Let's go do that. That's how I network. I find the people I want to hang out with and I go make friends. And I do those things before I ever talk business. That's how I network. A lot of my friends make fun of me because at WordCamp OC a few years back, I said, I don't have clients, I have friends. And that stuck with me. But I really do believe that. Because the people I do business with, I'm close with. I trust. I can take them out to dinner. I can take them out to drinks. And those things become important when the shit hits the fan. Surround yourself with good people. I've been very, very fortunate over the years that most of the hiring I've done has been really top-notch, smart, quality, hard-working people. I learn a lot from the people I surround myself with, both colleagues, friends, business associates, and my employees. So whatever you do, surround yourself with good people, smart people. I like to hire people that are smarter than me. This one I talk about all the time. With my clients, the buck stops here. I'm going to take responsibility no matter what. Whether it's my fault or not, I'll find a way. This is a whole other session by itself, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. But take responsibility and be a grown-up. And last, become a thought leader. Lead a meetup. Start a podcast. Blog. You've got some expertise in some area that you can share. Everyone in this room. So share it and give back to the community. My name is Steve Zengit, and now I will take questions. <laughs> What's that? Throughout the ways in technology, it seems like you said you had some ups and downs with the experience. Uh -huh. Out of all the moves that you had, which one would you pick out to say helped you the most and why? Let's see if I understand the question. Out of, out of all the, the turns I've taken over the years, which one helped me the most? Oh, which one? From the conversations you had, uh -huh. it seemed like you had some ups and downs. I did. Ooh, good question. So which one? I think, they're, I think they're all important, but I think I'm, I'm really sort of focused on uh, altruism, right? Giving back, being selfless. And here's why. Because if your motivation with meeting somebody or going into a meeting or anything is business first, making money, greed, it's going to come off as false. Right? It's going to come, come across as um, disingenuous. So the, the, the reason I point to that one is because that's more of an internal belief. Right? You have to believe that to be able to portray it. Right? I really do want to give back. I really do want to help my clients. Those are things I actually believe. And because of that, when I take a meeting, they know I'm there to help. Or when I'm, meeting, you know, when I'm meeting somebody, if I'm networking, you know, they know I'm there to help them as well. Yep. How do you decide it's time to pivot? How do you decide that it's time to pivot? 
Well, I think uh, bottom line is a good indication, right? So are you making the same money that you were making last year, last week, right? It, you know, are you, seeing, are you seeing things change? Are you think, seeing different trends monetarily? I think that's a good indication, right? Are your interests changing, right? Is the industry changing? You know, sometimes, um, you know, I see the technology that we develop become commoditized. That's a good indication that it might be time to you know, find a different expertise or find something else that you're offering or maybe move into products. Depends. So it's gonna, be, it's gonna be a different answer for everybody in this room. For me, it was always technology driven. You know, we were forced out of director because director died. There was just no more director work, it dried up. There was a period I missed in there where we were flash developers for a short period, <laughs> right? And Apple killed that opportunity pretty quick. So it's going to be a little bit different for everybody. Yep. Uh, what's the difference between failing unsuccessfully and failing successfully? What you learn. So the question was, what's the difference between failing successfully and failing unsuccessfully? It's your takeaway, right? Everybody fails. It's, and that's a, that's a good thing if you learn from it and if you don't make those mistakes again. And you may make the mis same mistake over, you know, a few times. But again, as long as you're learning from those things, that's what's important. So it's your takeaway that sets you apart. If you keep doing it, do the same thing over and over again, wait, isn't that the definition of insanity? <laughs> yep. Thank you. Oh my God. Right now I'm trying to stop sweating. But the, um, in the next five years, um, I'm looking toward mobile opportunities, right? So I'm looking more toward mobile apps, things like that. Um, I, I think that's where the opportunities lie right now, right? Website work is still gonna be there. It's always gonna be, that's just sort of consistent for us, right? But as far as services go, we're, we're really looking toward mobile. It's where we've been looking for a couple of years anyway. I think there was an exciting announcement last week uh, with the new Apple TV. So Apple TV just announced that you can do apps on, on the new Apple TV that's about to come out. I think that's exciting. And I think there's just going to be more and more development in the mobile space. So if you're not already thinking about mobile, you should be. Whether it's from an app standpoint, from a responsive standpoint, from a website standpoint, anything. Mobile's where it's at. Just ask this man. I'm pointing at Scott Bollinger. So the question was, how do you find great people? How do you hire great people, right? That's a tricky one, right? So what I've, the way I've always answered that one is, hire slow, fire fast. So if somebody's not working out, let them go. The, the thing I look for when I'm hiring is not so much technical expertise, obviously that's what got him in the door, right? But I'm looking at if somebody's a good fit with our team, right? We have a certain culture. Right? We have certain sense of humor uh, with our team, and they have to fit. And if somebody's not the right fit, it's pointless to, to work with that person, because right? the team's got to gel. Does that help? Yep. So the question was more complicated than I can answer for the camera. So that's a very good technology question. I partner with hosts. So I have two hosts that I partner with. That's WP Engine and Pagely. And they handle all my hosting needs. So I don't have an answer to your question. Apologize. What else? Yep. Uh, where's the after after party? <laughs> as, as I mentioned, I have my daughters with, here, with me here tonight. So next year.
All right, thank you very much.